Purdue Pharma and other opioid makers are facing thousands of suits, accusing them of sparking a deadly opioid epidemic. But what's that got to do with your local art museum? This week, where public health and public art meet, is a powerful place for public action. Go to a major museum in any of a slew of big cities this summer, and you could well get a chance to do much more than look at pictures. People are protesting the funders of some of the world's most prestigious institutions, and they're looking not just at the art, but at the names on those buildings more closely. A case in point, the Sackler family. That name's become synonymous with giving to the arts. The Sacklers have donated millions to cultural institutions, including the Guggenheim and the Met in New York, and the Victoria and Albert and the Tate Museum in London. The Sackler family fortune comes from OxyContin, a powerful narcotic that's become one of the most common and aggressively marketed drugs involved in prescription overdose deaths. The company that markets the drug, Purdue Pharma, stands accused of criminal acts, including lying to doctors and the government. Fossil fuel dollars are also becoming increasingly toxic as activists take to the streets in this country and the UK. So what does all this mean for the arts and for public health and our culture? Let's talk about it with author and activist L.A. Kaufman, Professor Jonathan H. Marks, author of a new book on the perils of partnerships, and Jess Worth, co-director of Culture Unstained, who's joining us from the UK, where her group's working to end the fossil fuel sponsorship of culture. Welcome, all of you. I where should we start? I mean, let's talk about how much money we're talking about to begin, then we'll talk about some of the actions. How much money are we talking about? Jonathan, you want to start there? Well, the ironic thing is that we're talking about what are relatively small sums of money, especially when it comes to corporate donors. It's almost drops in the ocean to them, millions of dollars here, here and there, compared to billions of dollars in revenue and profits. So that's the first thing, is that the money is a drop in the ocean to the corporate donors, but often it feels to the recipients like the water that's keeping them afloat. And the ubiquity of it all, L.A.? Well, certainly when you look into the Sackler family in the museum world, you can hardly go to a mu major museum without seeing their name on the wall. They um, were very savvy and strategic in trying to cleanse their reputation by giving widely and ensuring that every place they gave these, these drops in the ocean, relatively small amounts relative to their vast fortune, that they would be celebrated with signage and prestige. Mm, and what makes this money just so bad in your view? Well, the Sackler family uh, was uh, directly responsible for causing the opioid crisis. They oversaw an aggressive marketing campaign that misled patients and doctors about the strengths and dangers of their medication, their signature medication, OxyContin, and has led to hundreds of thousands of deaths. The aspect of this that has to do with fossil fuels, Jess, let me bring you in on that. It's not unrelated, it's similar. You've had some extraordinary actions even recently in the UK. Want to tell us about those? Yeah, there's a really um, growing movement in the UK of creative people challenging fossil fuel sponsorship of culture, particularly BP, which has sort of cherry picked some of our most iconic cultural institutions like the British Museum, the National Portrait Gallery, the Royal Shakespeare Company to sponsor. Um, and so, and I'm part of this movement, we go into oil sponsored spaces and we kind of use the creative medium that's being, um, that's, that's being used to critique the sponsorship. So there is, there's music, there's theatre, there's performance art, there's a lot of audience participation and we find that we get a different kind of response from people when we're in those cultural spaces um, performing and being creative rather than if we were standing there with more traditional placards and banners. Let's see a clip of one of the recent demonstrations, this one at the British Museum. in the middle of a climate crisis. We are here 
because 16 years ago, the largest mobilization of people across the world took place to protest the Iraq war. Destroying lives and polluting water equals colonialism. The climate crisis is already destroying homes and lives, and BP is fueling it. The British Museum is complicit in this destruction by accepting BP's sponsorship. Those who are creating the crisis are the least affected by it. We must stand in solidarity with those on the front lines of climate change, resisting it wherever we can. This means dropping BP. These are the very same sponsors who advocated for the war, which destroyed my homeland and slaughtered my people all in the name of oil. To BP and to the British Museum, I say how dare you use my culture and my history as an attempt to hide your colonial skeleton. Just coming back to you for a second, why the cultural funding, especially? Why has that gotten your your goat, and why is that your target at this point? Yeah, I mean, it kind of starts with one of the biggest stumbling blocks to climate action, and it's pretty clear that the power and the influence of the fossil fuel industry and the lobbying that they do is one of the main things that's actually stopping us decarbonizing at the. Um, at the speed we need to. Um, and so we look at, well, how are oil companies allowed to do that? It's because they have what, what they call a social license to operate. It's like the permission we as a society give them to go about their business activities in the way that we do, that they do. And they very, very strategically target cultural organizations to sponsor, to partner with, and that's part of trying to shape that social license to operate. They're essentially trying not just to appeal to the general public and to kind of improve their reputation. They can't be that bad if they're sponsoring the British Museum, can they? But also they're trying to appeal to sort of political and cultural and financial elites that all kind of network together on the boards of these institutions at the VIP receptions and so on. And so it's a very calculated move by BP, which is facing not just an image problem, but an existential mm. challenge in that we need to leave fossil fuels in the ground and we need to transition 100% away from them very fast over the next few decades. Um, and so it's fighting back with cultural sponsorship. So we're basically going to the place where BP is trying to shape its own image and telling a different story. Mm. And the Sacklers, I mean, does that Sackler investment in the arts, does it work to reach the elites and so, so on that, that Jess was just talking about? Well, I think what we've seen with the Sackler family was they have been able for decades to avoid any kind of accountability for their actions in the opioid crisis. And the, you know, I don't know that it's been the networking so much as the cultural prestige that they, that they bought with their money that is part of what has insulated them from accountability of any kind. Um, at the well, same because time- Because people just don't want to go off to someone they sat next to at a gala or something? I think it's, I think the way it works is a little more subtle and diffuse than that. Um, but I don't think that it's accidental. Um, you know, the, the work that, that our group, Pain Prescription Addiction Intervention Now, has done protesting the Sacklers. We've held a series of disruptive protests, much like the BP or not BP protests, um, in museums, um, you know, that work built on the work of journalists um, and uh, a number of major lawsuits that have, were lodged against the Sackler family. But I don't think it's accidental that at the same time that we, um, through protest, made, have made inroads in their sanitizing of their reputation in cultural institutions, that we suddenly see lawsuits that are tackling um, and charging individual members of the Sackler family and holding them legally accountable. I think um, the larger climate, cultural climate of impunity in this era um, is something that um, uh, cards institutions have uh, unfortunately been part of, and these protests are successful in undermining. Can you, can you prove, I mean, I want to believe that it's true, I want to believe, but can you prove <clears throat> a connection between your like fabulous actions at the Guggenheim, which we'll show some of, and for example, the new attorney general in New York, the Letitia James, bringing a suit. Well, I haven't spoken to anyone from the attorney general's office, but certainly when you look at the settlement that just happened uh, not too long ago with Purdue Pharma in the case in Oklahoma, one of the reasons that they settled as quickly as they did is they did not want that to go to a jury trial. And they did not want that to go to a jury trial because there has, thanks to our actions and the work of many journalists and actions by others, 
been so much publicity that um, you know the jury pool is highly influenced mm -hmm. by um, the the new common sense that these were criminal actions by the Sackler family um, that they should be held accountable for. There are people, um, Jonathan, aren't there, who say, well, this is, isn't, isn't this kind of a win-win? I mean, it's better that the corporations are doing something good, they made this money, and where else are we going to get our money from for art and culture? So these are the stories we're commonly told. It's a win-win for everyone. But I want to make a distinction. I think it's an important one between corporate influence and individual donors. Mm -hmm. Now, the money they get obviously is not distinct, but I want to talk about the difference. So when corporations like BP or Coca-Cola, which is also funding exercise initiatives throughout Britain, <laughs> um, uh, other food companies, opioid companies like Purdue Pharma, when they sort of w build their webs of influence, right, that's directly contributing to a public health problem. So when Purdue Pharma gave money to pain management or organizations, patient advocacy groups, those groups produced guidelines encouraging more prescribing. And when the CDC tried to create guidelines pushing back on prescribing, they sort of lobbied the CDC saying, no, 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 we shouldn't make it difficult for people to get access to opioids. So, it is important to recognize that these corporate webs of influence are the ones that are usually directly fueling the problems. And that's not to say that um, individual donors burnishing their family reputations is not problematic. That can be problematic for the reasons we've already heard. But I think it is important to make that distinction. Well, the other structural point that you're raising is the context in which all this funding is happening, which is a withdrawal by the state from its responsibilities for funding art. I mean, this period that we're talking about, well, in the UK, it's a period of austerity. Is that connected to the sort yes. of surfacing of this issue as a priority, Jess? I think it definitely makes it harder for organizations to say no, but actually these relationships with BP in particular go back quite a long way. So I think this is a tactic that the oil industry and other very controversial industries like tobacco and arms have used for quite a long time um, to improve their reputation. What about that sort of systemic shift of, of responsibility vis-a-vis -vis the webs that you're talking about? Yeah, so I think what happens is public bodies are underfunded as are cultural institutions and so they're looking for money and corporations are quite happy to provide that money. It's a drop in the ocean for them and it builds these relationships and webs of influence. But so I it, guess what I'm saying is it doesn't it also in a way give government permission to back out. So Those points of light that George W. Herbert Walker Bush used to talk about. So absolutely, it tends to fuel this. And what I've said um, publicly and indeed to my own institution and to other institutions is that public health officials, academic administrators, and for that matter, leaders of cultural institutions should stop taking money from corporate donors with great public celebration while keeping their reservations privately to themselves. It's time for them to speak out and say, make the case mm. for why their organizations need public funding. But wouldn't they just say, oh, well, then we'd have to close our doors? Isn't that what they say, LA? I mean, that is what they say, but. Uh, but it's not clear that those are the only alternatives. How so? Uh, well, I think that, that uh, when you look at some institutions like the Metropolitan Museum, like, do they really need to be continually expanding? When yeah. you're talking about expansions, we're talking about property acquisition, um, capital investment. It's not just more shows they've been doing, which, which does suggest they're not hard up for cash. Yeah, the, you, see, you see a lot of um, moves towards aggressive expansion by institutions that seem to be moving them away from their core mission, and they're funded by this dirty money. And, um, you know, in, in many cases, you, you begin to wonder, are, do, are, are museums um, first and foremost looking to showcase art, or are they first and foremost looking to showcase galas for the ultra-rich? You mentioned the words dirty money, and that always sends off a firestorm of all money, in a sense, is dirty in a capitalist system. Someone's been exploited, someone's been expropriated, some land has been despoiled. How do you draw the line, Jess, or do you? Well, I think it's actually up to cultural organizations to draw the line, depending on what their mission and their values are. And actually, they, they always have done. 
Um, if you look back, I don't know if it's probably the same in the US, if you look back 20 years, so much art and so much sport was sponsored by tobacco companies. They were absolutely everywhere. And then gradually, as society sort of woke up to the dangers, just as is happening with the opioid crisis now, government started to regulate. It just became completely unacceptable for tobacco companies to be sponsorship partners anymore. Um, and so things shift. And I think there's already, um, there are um, ethical guidelines um, that museums and galleries use when they're looking at new sponsors. They're supposed to go through a process of due diligence and so on. That's good practice in the sector. Um, Sector-wide bodies like the Museums Association and the Institute of Fundraisers say that is good practice. So the problem is not that this is a new idea. It's that actually these institutions aren't taking these responsibilities seriously or haven't thought carefully enough about what are our values and who are appropriate organisations to partner with. So I think we're seeing a rebalancing at the moment of where those red lines are drawn in a, in a really positive way. And it's almost like it's a new engagement with some of the crises that have become more evident in society over the last few years, like climate change and like the opioid crisis. Um, and cultural institutions are, are just sort of catching up and realizing that maybe they need to do something. Do they know how to draw the lines? I mean, you teach bioethics, Jonathan. I do, I do. People often talk about institutions becoming corrupted, but if you want an institution to change and you tell them they're becoming corrupted, they'll go on the defensive. So here's what I say, do you care about integrity? They say yes. What does integrity mean for us as individuals? What we say, what we do, what we, we believe, they should be consistent with each other. And the same thing goes for institutions. You look at what an institution says it does, its mission, you look at what its purpose is and its finding document, and you look at what it actually does. Mm. Those should be consistent. And then you look at the institution you're taking money from, and you ask the same question. What do they do? What do they say they do? And what are they obligated to do? And if there's a tension, between all those and what your own institution does, says it does, and is an obligation to do, then that's a problem for you. But I will tell you that my feeling is that right now the way institutions are reacting is not primarily with their integrity in mind, but with public trust in mind. Mm -hmm. Now public trust is important, but bolstering trust in institutions that don't have integrity or trustworthiness is problematic. I want institutions to stop going first and foremost to PR managers and thinking instead about institutional ethics. One of the great examples right now is this epidemic of measles um, and refusal to vaccinate because of people's lack of trust in those vaccines. Absolutely, and here's what I would say. We really have to solve the problem of corporate influence in science and public health before you can solve the anti-vaccine movement. And people who try to do the latter without the former are, I'm afraid, doomed to fail. Well, that takes me back to how the heck do you do that in a for-profit medical system? I mean, what would Purdue Pharma say their mission is? Is it to relieve pain or make enormous profits? Well, what they say and what they do are quite different. Yes, they say that their mission is to, is to alleviate pain. Um, but uh, we've, we've seen that they have done so in a way that overly pushes pain medications on people who don't need them and that um, pushes dosages onto people that become very quickly addictive. It needs to be said we did reach out to at least one branch of the Sackler family, Elizabeth Sackler, who um, I've known in a social sense. She supported the first feminist art uh, gallery institution, I think in the world, at the Brooklyn Art Museum. When asked about this, she will say, my branch of the family didn't benefit. Um, what do you say? There were um, three brothers in the Sackler family, and Arthur Sackler um, uh, and his heirs claim that they are not complicit with the opioid crisis because Arthur died before OxyContin was produced. However, Arthur Sackler was the marketing genius who, in the development and promotion of Valium, created a model of aggressive promotion of prescription drugs for uses that went way beyond the strictest labeled use, um, and that set a pattern of extreme profitability and dependency. You know, our group has protested at the Arthur Sackler Gallery at the Smithsonian Museum in Washington, D.C., and we don't make a distinction between the different branches of the family in terms of their culpability and their need to um, be accountable to the vast, vast human wreckage that was created by their actions. Mm, is Elizabeth Sackler moved by the fact that pain is headed up by one of our great 
women artists, photographer Nan Golden. Elizabeth Sackler has expressed support for, for Nan Golden and for the work that she's been doing, um, but it's, at this point it has been only words and has not been backed up by any actions of any kind. Elizabeth Sackler, come on, come talk to us. Um, Jess, back to you. We're having this conversation in a country that has for-profit medicine, and I think that has led to all kinds of reasons for mistrust, for abuse, etc. How do you think that affects the situation in the UK that you, you do have a national health system? We do. We have a national health system and we need to hang on to it because what's going on at the moment, I'm sure you've heard all about Brexit um, and, and the sort of chaos that our politics has descended into. And one of the things that's really at risk is if we do leave the European Union and we start signing trade deals with the US, one of the things is that the pharmaceutical companies have really got their eye on our national health service. So we need to be really careful about that. Um, but I think I'd actually like to go back to sure. what Jonathan said about what we're not really seeing is institutions actually showing integrity. Yeah. It's almost like they're responding to crises with a sort of public relations move. Um, and I, I think we might have just seen the first example of the opposite of that in the UK, because just a couple of weeks ago, um, the Edinburgh Science Festival, which has been sponsored by different oil companies for years, is currently sponsored by Exxon and Total, actually made a statement saying that they would no longer take any funding from fossil fuel companies or from industry, oil industry lobby groups. Um, and they said, oh, I'm just going to read this because it's really groundbreaking, I think. They said, um, with climate change ever present and urgent, we feel increasingly compromised by the conflict between accepting sponsorship from fossil fuel companies and programming events that scrutinise the main causes of climate change. There's a conflict between their behaviour and the underlying science. And that's exactly what we've been arguing. Um, and so it's really fantastic to see uh, a cultural organisation sort of acknowledging that for themselves and making such a strong statement. And so I'm hopeful that maybe this could be the first domino that starts to fall um, and that cultural organisations can be a bit more proactive about safeguarding their integrity and don't have to do it as a kind of rearguard action when the pressure becomes too much. Mm, LA, victories so far here that you want to mention, dominoes falling? Well, we had a whole series of victories uh, beginning first the National Portrait Gallery announced that they would not accept a major gift, uh, major for them, drop in the ocean for the Sacklers of $1.4 million, uh, or made up in 1.4 million pounds um, from the Sackler family. Um, at, and then that was quickly followed uh, first by the Tate um, and then the Guggenheim. Um, and within 48 hours, uh, the, both the Sackler Trust and the Sackler Foundation in the UK announced that they were suspending all giving for the time being. Um, a series of other institutions have followed. We saw the dominoes falling very quickly. Um, the question, of course, is what happens to those funds now? Um, and uh, the urgent need is for vast sums of money to go into treatment and recovery for the huge numbers of people who are struggling with addiction, um, who find it very hard, uh, it's very difficult to get medication-assisted treatment. Um, there are very few doctors who can prescribe it. Um, there are very few safe injection facilities. Um, they are underground for the most part. Um, there's uh, you know, an enormous need um, to, to, to kind of claw that money back from the Sackler family and, and put it um, to addressing the crisis. That hasn't happened yet, but these, these dominoes falling represent a, a real shift um, in accountability um, and uh, certainly uh, what we're hoping is that uh, as these lawsuits proceed, um, that we will see those funds um, taken from the Sackler family, clawed back from where they've transferred it um, overseas um, and applied to programs that can, can help people struggling with the consequences of their actions. That's the divest invest part kind of. Um, Jonathan, to you, we saw this year the huge um, fire at the Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. And as people have been talking about rebuilding, a whole conversation has broken out that touches on these matters. Absolutely. The news today, of course, is that a number of um, individual benefactors have come forward. Somebody offered 100 million euros, and then that was somebody else came in with an offer of 200 a day or two after. Um, and so it's raised this question 
about the, the very structure of taxation and the very structure of public giving. We live in a culture where the norm is you do well, then you do good. Um, and, the question, and what people in France are doing now is calling that very norm into question. Should we be thinking of a different way of going about things? And I will say that there's been some empirical research in the corporate uh, social responsibility world which shows that companies engage in what's often called either moral licensing or moral compensation. And moral licensing means that having been generous in the public sphere, they then, that then sort of justifies or fuels them engaging in problematic ethical business unethical business practices. And moral compensation is having engaged in those ethically problematic practices they then give. And so that, I think, is something we need to really focus on. But you don't think there's a Notre Dame brought to you by Total in our future? <laughs> so I do think institutions should be much more careful with their naming rights. There was, as you may recall, a Ken Lay chair of business ethics. Mm. And I think what institutions are beginning to realize is that, is that their institution's reputation depends on th the names they stick on the front of their buildings. And they are, I think, going forward, going to need to be much more careful about that. We will continue this conversation. Um, I will have a chance to talk more with um, Jonathan Marks uh, in our audio extras. So check that out. And I want to thank everybody for, for coming on the program today. It's been great talking with you. Congratulations. Thanks so much for, for having me. Thank you.